Hello friends and welcome to the Chisscast, a podcast if you're new here, a podcast where I talk about my love for Grand Admiral Thrawn and all of his chiss and non-chiss friends. So we're on episode three and before we do anything else, let's go into a very sad segment of Chiss News. So if you've been online and if you're a Thrawn fan, you know that the book got postponed five months and it's gonna come out on October 6th instead of May 5th. I'm not sad about it. I'm not sad about it. I'm over it. I'm definitely not sad about it. I'm literally about to cry. <laughs> Why, Delray? Why? I was so heartbroken. <laughs> That day on Chiss Twitter was like, everybody else all the time, I was like, why is Chiss Twitter crying? What happened? Did Thrawn die? (laughs) I think someone legit said, I thought that Thrawn died. (laughs) Everybody's so sad. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, pretty much, you know, the same level of sadness. But like, if we got this sad over a book being delayed, imagine how sad we would be if Thrawn actually got killed once again in the new canon. So yeah, they delayed the book. And, uh, uh, you know, everybody's sad. But the, the one the one thing, the silver lining to this is that I guess we're getting a prettier book because I already expressed multiple times on Twitter.com my complex feelings towards the Chaos Rising cover. And now that the book is going to have blue edged pages, it's it like it slightly redeems itself, I feel like. <laughs> they slightly they slightly redeem themselves, you know, after doing that to the cover of the book. So I feel like the, the blue pages are gonna <laughs> are gonna make the book worth pre-ordering because I literally pre-ordered it the day when the pre-orders uh, started and we didn't know what the cover would look like and then the cover came out and I was like, I regret it! I regret the pre-ordering the physical copy! I don't want this cover! Because I legit... I, I want the physical book pretty much just because of the cover because I mainly listen to audiobooks or read on on my iPhone, so... I don't really read physical books, I just want them for collection purposes, and that, that, you know. The blue pages are gonna make it a little bit more collectible and displayable, I feel like. So, enough about the blue pages, let's talk about another thing that's actually <laughs> exciting that uh, Delray revealed, you know, a little, a little tidbit that they revealed to make up for the delay, even though that doesn't even begin to make up for the delay, in my opinion. But hey, I'm grateful for every little crumb we get. So, um, and there's a thing called Dramatis Personae. Now, I probably mispronounced that terribly, because it's literally the first time that I've heard this phrase. Like, I knew that it was a thing in plays, uh, in stage plays, but I didn't know how it was called. So if I mispronounce Dramatis Personae, p- forgive me. I <laughs> I genuinely don't know it. I'm too lazy to Google it. Anyway, so this book, apparently earlier Legends books uh, also used to have that, which I've, I've never really read a book that actually had a Dramatis Personae. Um, I know that, you know, like some books have like maps and other trivia uh, in the, in the front of the book or the back of the book. Uh, to help readers understand the world better. And uh, uh, the editor, Tom, said that this Dramatis Personae is going to be something like that, like some of the names of the characters and the titles and the families uh, and stuff like that. Maybe we'll even get like a like a official canon map of the Ascendancy. That would be really cool because I think the only maps of the Ascendancy we have are from Legends, and as of right now, we literally know nothing in the new canon about the Ascendancy, aside from the fact that Scylla... Oh god, that is another thing. How do y'all pronounce Scylla? Because I just say Scylla. I, I, I've i seen other uh, other people say Xilla, uh, which would make sense, but why would you say Xilla when Chiss are pronounced Chiss? 
is it just Chisilla? <laughs> this doesn't help the fact the fact that I have a retainer doesn't really help <laughs> trying to pronounce Scylla. I just say Scylla. I don't know why. It's just my preferred way to say it. Um, and I don't think I've listened... Like, and was it mentioned in any audiobook? I don't think uh, the name Scylla has been mentioned in the new Canon Throne books yet. Because if, if it was, I wouldn't know how to pronounce it because I've listened to those books so many times. So yeah, where was I? Yeah, uh, I think the only thing we know about the Ascendancy from the new canon, aside from the fact that there are nine ruling families, <laughs> which was revealed in the, in the intro of the first Ascendancy book that Mark Thompson read out in his throne voice, uh, in when the book was announced, and that that still fucks me up because that intro is like makes me emo uh, all by itself. But yeah, I you know like aside from that, I I keep I keep uh, interrupting myself and I keep getting distracted by other things. The only canon info we have on the ascendancy is the nine ruling families and the fact that. Scylla is still, like, the main Chiss planet, the, the, the world that they originated from, I guess. So, I hope they cram as much cool info about the Ascendancy into these books as possible. So, um, that's, that's all the Chiss news. Also, uh, the editor Tom has promised us the, uh, the Thrawn editorial playlist, and there's still no sign of it! It's been a week, Tom! Where is it? <laughs> Where is our playlist? I literally every single day I'm like, when is he gonna release it? Like I'm I'm such a hoe for music. Especially when it comes to like like imagine it's kind of like getting the soundtrack of a movie that you've been looking forward to like a week early and then you get to listen to the soundtrack. I think I did with the uh with the Moana soundtrack and the Frozen soundtrack. Like I listen to the soundtrack and I have no idea about the movie, but like I kind of you know, like, you kind of start making theories and, and stuff like that, and head cannons and whatnot, and that is really exciting. So I feel like this playlist is as close to a book having a soundtrack as we're gonna get, and I really, I really want to hear that playlist. <laughs> I know that they don't listen to my podcast, but, like, Tom, please, please, it's been ages. <laughs> okay, enough about that. I feel like that's, that's enough for Chiss News. Um, I don't think anything else happened. We've, I, I've just been incredibly sad. Like, I literally... If you follow me on Twitter, and if you came here from Twitter, you know how sad I was to have to reset my damn countdown in my display name. I've never been this loyal to a countdown before. I started counting down from the day that the book was announced. It was, I think, like 215 days back then. And it was literally like 95 days left. And they announced that they're delaying the book, and I, <laughs> it was like sad piano music, and I, and I had to re uh, restart the countdown, and it was at two hundred and fifty days, and now it's what two hundred and forty two days, so yeah, I I think yeah, uh, today is the seventh, so yesterday, uh, was officially eight months until Chaos Rising comes out. Unless they delay it again. In which case, I will storm the Del Rey book's office and demand the book because it's literally already finished. Speaking of which, when are we starting to demand for an excerpt? Because the book is literally done. Like, it's done. They just have uh, some scheduling issues or whatever. When are we getting an excerpt? I'm getting desperate <laughs> Can you tell that I'm really agitated and upset that they delayed the book? Oh god, I'm never gonna be over this, am I? Anyway, um, aside from that, I was going to talk about um, Heir to the Empire, because I feel like it's time that we talk about the actual Thrawn books. I think, yeah, last, last time I talked about if Thrawn is evil or not. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to talk about because there's literally 10 books. Aside from, sir, not, no, 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 the, what is it called? Choices of One. I haven't read Choices of One yet. Aside from Choices of One, there's 10 
throne books to discuss. So I feel like <laughs> I feel like we have content for like the next half a year at least. Uh, so another thing I was <laughs> I'll get to heir to the empire in a second. Another thing that I started reading is the um, it's called I think Clone Wars Secret Missions books, and it's basically about a squad of clone troopers, but it also features a young chis. Jedi Padawan called Nuru Kungurama and I absolutely adore him. I mean, <laughs> at this point I'm I am uh, uh, what's the word? I am determined to consume every single bit of chess content that there is. I don't think I've ever been this passionate about a character or a type of character as I am about the chess. So Heir to the Empire um, was the Second Legends Throne book that I've read after Outbound Flight. I feel like we need to keep Outbound Flight for another time. Let's go in, in actual chronological order in which the books were released. Because I know that I read Outbound Flight before any of the uh, other Legends books. So I, <laughs> I read it out of order. And it did affect the way that I saw certain things in in Heir to the Empire, but not that many. Mainly just Jorus Sabayoth. Oh god. That's let's talk about let's talk about Jorus Sabayoth. I know this is the Chiss cast and, and we just we're just here for Thrawn. I'm always here for Thrawn and the Chiss and his actual friends. But let's take a moment to talk about the absolute embodiment of a headache that is Jorus Sabayoth or Jorus Sabayoth. Uh, because it's it was his clone, and it took me literally like, it took me a while. <laughs> I had to go back and read his name again. I was like, wait, is he alive? How did he survive? He literally was, was blown up by those radiation bombs. And then I was told to go look at the name again, and it was Jorus Sabayoth. Um, so he was a clone, and he's the biggest pain in the ass in the entire Star Wars franchise that I've consumed so far. Like, he's kind of on the same level as uh, General Pong Krell from the Clone Wars, but like, like three times worse, <laughs> I feel like. Also, Sabayoth is another name that is a literal nightmare because, you know, me and my Lithuanian brain, I go read the book and I'm reading Joris Kabaoth. <laughs> so I just call him Kabaoth in my head. And I think that's it sounds weird, but it's also a little bit easier to say than Sabayoth. Like, what the fuck, Timothy? <laughs> what is that name? With the apostrophe too? Yeah. So, so he's a dick. And I feel like he just got more and more annoying as the books went by. Uh, and by, <laughs> by, by the time the trilogy ended, I was like, I... If he doesn't die in the next three pages, I am going to enter the book, astral project into the book, and kill that motherfucker with my own two hands. I've, I don't think I've ever been this annoyed at a character. I think it's uh, a good comparison, well, at least, like, somewhat fitting comparison would be uh, Umbridge from Harry Potter. Like, that was the first character that I clearly remember passionately hating and wishing terrible things on him. Like, but, but, but Sabayoth is, like, next level. Because, you know, like, he's one of the bad guys, but he is just worse than every single bad guy combined. He is the bad guy that is so incredibly annoying that you just... Ah! Oh, God, I hate him! So... Um, I can't remember if Luke went to, I think Luke went to train with him in, in, in the first book. I think so. Was it in the first book or in the second book? Because I feel like the first book was just, uh, him and Mara going through that forest and, you know, trying not to kill each other, <laughs> trying to work together. Uh, and and uh, then after that, he went to Wayland to train, and then Mara was like, well, 
here goes nothing, I have to go save that unfortunate twink. So, <laughs> I actually really, like, that's, that, that was my first um, good impression of Mara. Uh, <laughs> is that, you know, like, she, she went to save Luke. I know that she had ulterior motives, she needed his help, but, like, still... That was, like, the first time that I genuinely enjoyed her character. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. So, Heir to the Empire. I was... <laughs> one of my first impressions about it, aside from Thrawn Sexy, was the fact that Luke... Basically, Luke was brooding on the roof, you know, after having that dream uh, with Obi-Wan. He was brooding, and he just kept describing this drink that he's having as exotic and really like cool and alien and then it's literally it says it's called hot chocolate <laughs> it just i was i was i was floored <laughs> i was blown away <laughs> I, I i i just love luke and he is he's luke he's adorable in those books i feel like luke is a little bit more insufferable in like Dark Force Rise, no, no, Dark Force Rising. Uh, I mean, he's more insufferable in 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 the Hand of Throne duology, and in Survivor's Quest, he's not that cool. But like in in the uh, in the Heir to the Empire trilogy, he's really adorable. He's really Luke, and he says things like "uh oh," <laughs> which is which is really cool. I keep like I I I I'm talking about Heir to the Empire, and then I keep mixing up what things happened when because like the entire <laughs> the entire legends continuity except for survivor's quest is like one blur <laughs> one big blur <laughs> especially the hand of throne duology like that when they say visions of the future was going to be a really long book they did not lie it was a really fucking long book. I don't remember half of what happened in it. Anyway, this is a, an Heir to the Empire episode. I keep getting distracted once again. Let's talk about Thrawn. <laughs> you know, 20 minutes in. Let's talk about what we actually came here to talk about. Let's talk about Thrawn himself. So, but the best thing that Thrawn did in Heir to the Empire, or rather that entire trilogy was when he killed or ordered Rook to kill that one officer. Like, that was the kind of truly terrifying evil that I wanted to see, and I was sad that there wasn't more of that in that trilogy, because, like, the impression that I got was that Thrawn was more ruthless uh, in the the original trilogy, which is true, but I expected him to be even more, like, more evil and more unforgiving and, like, you know, kill people because that's sexy. <laughs> I wanted him to be, like, menacing and I wanted to actually be scared of him. Uh, and, of course, granted him being the villain, he didn't really get much... Uh, what is the book equivalent of screen time? <laughs> Because you can't say screen time when you're talking about the book, but that's what I want to say, because I don't know an alternative word. Like, he he didn't really get a lot of action because he was the villain, and the book plot was about the original characters, you know, the original trio, Hanley and Luke, and also Lando, 3PO, uh, R2, and stuff like that. You know, the, <laughs> the OG team, and, and Thrawn was the villain. So he he didn't get that much action, and I was kind of sad about it. Uh, Rook is another thing that that entire trilogy changed my view of him, like my opinion of him, so drastically. When I watched Rebels, Rook was, I feel like he was another one of those villains where you just want him dead, you just want that creature to perish. Uh, I don't remember who, but somebody uh, on Twitter replied to my Rebels ranking, like the ranking of all the Rebels characters, that every single episode they wish that Rook would just die, <laughs> like every single episode. And I can relate to that because first, my first round watching Rebels, that's how I felt too, but then I read the original Throne trilogy and now Rook is like... One of my favorite things about Rebels Season 4 
Well, like that end, of course, like he dies in a very anticlimactic way. Like he just gets like, uh, what is he like? He gets crushed in some like, uh, reactor generator thing. Like he he just he just dies, you know, falls down a hole, like you know people in Star Wars often do. Uh, but I really do like him now, and uh, as many people have said before and since the Nogri subplot in the original Thrawn trilogy was one of my favorite parts, if not my favorite part of that trilogy. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very excited about uh, the fact that we are getting the Ascendancy trilogy, because if there's anything that Mr. Zahn is very good at, like he's incredibly good at it, is tying, like, making a lot of plot threads, a lot of little, you know, like, I don't know how to describe it, like, he can make a big overarching plot, and he can make all the threads tie in together in, like, the last 50 pages of the last book of the trilogy. I remember I had a little bit of trouble going through the first two books of the trilogy. But when it came to The Last Command, I breezed through it. I read it in like five days because everything was coming together and I was so excited to find out what comes next. So if the Ascendancy trilogy is going to be anything like that, plus Baby Thrawn, it's going to be literally the best thing I ever got. I'm so glad that I got into Thrawn. This is going to be the best fucking content. Anyway, so... Back to the Heir to the Empire. So, Rook is another character that I just really fell in love with, you know. <laughs> and the way that he was portrayed in the Indie Legends comics, like, like, in the, in the Rebel show, he was, like, like, kind of, like, lean and spindly and kind of bug-like. And then in, in the Thrawn comic, like, the Indie adaptation of Heir to the Empire, he was, like, this buff guy. <laughs> this, like, big, buff, gray alien. <laughs> and that just, just, that just made me laugh the first time I saw it. But yeah, Rook is great. I like Rook. You know, unpopular opinion time, but I really do like him. Now another Thrawn and Rook friends character that I don't really talk about, uh, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of fans who love him, is Captain Pelion. And the Captain Pelion it has literally no personality in book one. He's literally... He just exists to um, tell the uh, the enemies, the Imperial side of the story. And I know why people love him, because um, by the time I finished all those Legends books, I really, you know, he really grew on me. And uh, I think in Throne Duology especially, he gets to shine. But in the... In the trilogy, he's just like he's just there. He just does. He just doesn't do anything except talk to Thrawn and ask him questions. Like, like literally, like there's there is no character there. there. He has no. Okay, he has one character trait, and it is missing the old empire. Oh, also another character trait: loving Thrawn. <laughs> Okay, he, he, you know, I can't relate to that, I guess. Like, he's at least somewhat relatable to me because I, too, love Thrawn and I stand him. And if I was with Thrawn on the bridge of the Chimera, I would, too, be like, like, star eyes. And I'm like, yes, Admiral, yes, please do tell me about all the complex tactics that I don't understand. But I will still nod and smile and say, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> So Pels is relatable. He's relatable. Um, but yeah, I know that my first impression of him was really meh because everybody was hyping him up so much. They're like, oh my god, can't wait till you meet Pelion. And I'm like, okay. And <laughs> like, he wasn't even slightly cool in the first books. But I can forgive that once again. It's not a story about him. It's not a story about the Imperials. It's not like in the New Throne books where Eli 
you know, like, not only you get told a story from Eli's point of view, but also he's one of the two main characters of the book. So he gets a lot of character development, and we love that. Oh my god. Now I'm thinking about Eli and his character development, and I know that it's a topic for another day, but god, I fucking love Eli Vanto. God, there's not a single day where I go without thinking about how much I love Eli Vanto. Honestly, the best character. Best book character ever. Never even read a book with a better character than Eli Vanto. Yeah. So, <laughs> this Eli Vanto love and appreciation interlude is over. I feel like we need to have, at one point, we need to have an episode that is just about loving Eli Vanto, because that's what our boy deserves. He's the best boy. Okay, what else about Heir to the Empire? I feel like, to me, books and shows and comics and any sort of media are more about character, like, characters, their dynamics, their relationships, than about the plot. So, so that's why I'm talking about more from the character's perspective and what I think of them, because the plot... What's the plot of Over to the Empire again? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Uh, Luke and Leia and Han were just running and running and running and running some more. And more running. They were just running from the Empire because Thrawn was like, I'm gonna catch you. And Sabaoth was like, I'm gonna catch you and corrupt you and make you Dark Jedi. And that was the plot. So, but that was good, you know, like, it was, it was a good plot, it was interesting, mostly, um, but let's talk about another one of my favorite Legends characters, Talon Card. I feel like I always forget to talk about him, but god, I love Talon Card so much. I think that's how we pronounce his name, I'm not sure, Talon? Talon or Talon? Talon. Talon Card. So, <laughs> I really like him because he's... He's a likable guy, and don't get me even started about his portrayal in the comic adaptation. Like, that was, that was a really hot talent card. Like, that was the one character in that comic adaptation that I was like, whoa, ho, 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 hello there. You know, because, because we all know how the Heir to the Empire comic adaptation portrayed Thrawn. You know, we all know about that, and we don't talk about it. No, we don't. Yeah, I live tweeted, I think, reading the comic. What didn't I live tweet at this point? <laughs> but yeah, uh, we don't talk about, about Heir to the Empire comic throne. Because he, he doesn't exist, you know. Forget about him. So Talon Card is one of those characters that is just likable. He's smart. He has a moral compass. He's extremely loyal. <laughs> I just remembered how his character arc is pretty much I'm not gonna get involved in politics proceeds to literally get involved in politics. I am not gonna get involved in politics further proceeds to get involved in politics. <laughs> I love him. I love him. He's, he's just good at what he does. He values information like Thrawn, but unlike Thrawn, he's not a fucking shithead. <laughs> Okay, like, he's menacing to his enemies, and I feel like the first time we're introduced to him, like, he's kind of intimidating, but after that, he's just really fucking cool. I don't know how to, how else to describe it, I just really like him. He's competent, he's uh, charming, he's confident, he has a, a smuggling-slash-information business empire. I think the fact that he is powerful and has power is also very attractive, but, you know, like, he doesn't really use that power for evil. He's more interested in, you know, like, selling information for the highest price, which is not really good either, but at least he's not, like, unlimited power, like Sheev, you know? So Talon Card is fucking great. Another thing that I want to give Timothy Zahn props for is the way that he writes Han. Like, that was one of the highlights for me in Heir to the Empire and the entire rest of the trilogy, and in the other books, pretty much. Any Anytime he writes Han, he is so good at writing Han. His dialogue, like, it's so on point. 
it's so fucking on point every single line like like that's the one character that made me laugh the most throughout these books and uh, i feel like uh, there was a final battle uh, in heir to the empire and Luke and it was basically Luke and Han's point of view, and they had such good banter. Like they had such good banter. I had so much fun reading that. <laughs> Another thing that I remember just now is that basically Thrawn spends the entire book saying how like you know like we're getting this one uh, ready for this one battle. It's going to be very important. It's going to be our chance to crush the rebellion once and for all. It's going to determine the future and blah blah blah. And when when he loses that battle, he's like, "It's not even that important. We're gonna win another battle. Don't worry, guys." <laughs> that was literally the <laughs> one of the most hilarious thing about that book. Like he genuinely like spent the entire book preparing for that battle, and then when he lost it, he was like, "Oh eh, no, well." <laughs> Honestly, same mood, same Thrawn. So, yeah, I I probably missed something. I missed a lot of things. It was a long book. Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't remember what Jorah Sabayoth was up to in that book. Because I, legit, when he wasn't mentioned for a while, I used to legit forget about his existence. <laughs> so, yeah. He just... So yeah, Jorah Sabayoth is terrible. Thrawn is pretty good in that book. I feel like my overall impression of Legends Thrawn from that book was kind of like... You know, he's not that cool. But I mean, I understand why it was so cool back in 1991. Because he, he was a very different villain from the other Star Wars villains before that. So I guess why people were really in love with him back then, but now that you have all this new canon material, the original trilogy pales, like, when it comes to Thrawn's character, it really pales in comparison. And I will never understand the people who worship and glorify the original Thrawn trilogy over everything else. I mean, I get the nostalgia, I really get it. I really get it, because the first thing that you fall in love with from a franchise or a series, it's always going to be your favorite. But some people go above and beyond to say that it's like the, you know, like it's the ultimate Thrawn content. And I, I, I don't think it is. Anyway, so that's that's too much discourse for today, okay? We're, we're doing it pretty chill today. So that's it. That's it about Heir to the Empire. I kept getting distracted. And talking about the other books, but it's really hard to talk about um, one book when you've read all of them. <laughs> and there's so many intertwined threads of plot and character development. So um, next time, I guess we're going to talk about Dark Force Rising, which is going to be really exciting. So... Unless something else pops up uh, that is relevant and we're gonna talk about that. But yeah, hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cheesecast. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being here with me a uh, third time in a row. I still can't believe I'm doing this. Never thought I'd have a podcast, let alone about Thrawn, but here we are. I'm really enjoying doing this. I hope you guys enjoy it too. Until next time, and may warrior's fortune smile on your efforts.